Okay, a very, very good morning from New York, and I know it's a good evening in India and Nepal and Asia. Can you guys hear me loud and clear? Abhishek, can you give me a message whether you're listening? <clears throat> Check. Okay. A very, very good morning from New York, and I know it's good evening in India and all Asia. Can you guys hear me loud and clear? All right. It seems that you are audible right now. So okay. So let's start today's seminar. My name is Dr. Tenzin and I work with Kaplan Medical and today's event was jointly organized by Kaplan Medical and LogiQuest India. I would like to thank you all for dedicating your time and keeping your time aside for attending this webinar. My name is Dr. Tenzin. I've been working with Kaplan Medical for almost more than 15 years now. I've been helping international students and doctors from all the parts of the world. Pre-pandemic time, I used to be visiting a lot of your places, and most probably I might have visited some of your universities in India as well. So today we'll be talking about USMLE and how to get residency in the United States, because that's the ultimate goal for most of you guys. And I understand that some of you guys are coming here with wealth of knowledge. Some of you guys are half knowledge, some of you guys have no knowledge and no clue what USMLE is. That is totally understandable. But today is the session where we will try to clear out all the doubts, if not everyone's doubt, but almost all's doubt, we'll try to clear it out. And again, at the end of the session, we will have Q&A that maybe we can tackle some of the questions that you have. I know you, are used, you can use the chat box, but try to minimize using that right now because we'll have Q&A sessions towards the end part. All right, without wasting much time, let's jump right in the sessions. So we are gonna talk about the processes. This is the most confusing part. The questions that looms in our head is almost always like, how do I do this? When should I do this? Why should I do this? And where should I do this? So these questions, we will clarify it as and when the time comes in the slides, okay? We will try to understand the USMLE first. As one of the Chinese philosophers said, if you know your enemy, and if you know yourself, then whenever you go to war, you are deemed to always win. And he says, secondly, that if you don't understand yourself, and don't know the enemy, then you're doomed to lose in the battle. So obviously, the enemy here, what he's saying that we can infer, it refers to the USMLE, right? So before we understand the USMLE, we have to know ourselves, mean you have to be rich in content. So you have to be strong in the content knowledge so that when you move on from the content knowledge, then you'll be able to fight the exams. So let's try to understand the USMLEs one by one. First step is going to be the step one, where they're going to test your knowledge on your first, second, and maybe third year of your basic sciences subjects. Anatomy, behavioral sciences, biochemistry, micro, immuno, pathology, pharmacology, and physiology. Eight hours test and seven blocks of exams followed by step to CK, which is clinical knowledge, not Calvin Klein, where they will test your knowledge on the final year subjects, which is internal medicine, pediatrics, surgery, ob and psychiatry. This step to CK exam is for nine hours, which includes eight blocks of test. 
Then after that, we have something new, relatively, called the OET, Occupational English Test. This is a test which was earlier replaced from the CS, Clinical Skills. So right now, we have the OET in replacement of the Step 2 CS, which is basically the same exam like TOEFL. The only difference here with TOEFL and OET is that in TOEFL test, they test your speaking listening, writing, and reading on a variety of topics that we don't even know and we are not comfortable with. But in the OET, all the essence, the ingredients of the communications, be it listening, reading, writing, or speaking, will be based upon the medical terminologies, medical diseases. The speaking part would be also talking and presenting a medical case. So that is why it's called the OET, which is Occupational English Test. Last, not the least, is going to be your step three exam. The subjects that is going to be tested on step three is the same one as the step two CK. Now the question is, if they have already tested those subjects, why are we testing it again? Now you should understand, even though the subjects are same, the step three is going to go one step deeper into patient care, post-management care, crisis management, and preventive medicine mainly, okay? So that is a two days exam, and the only additional part to the step three is they have one portion called the CCS, that is Clinical Case Simulation. Now, what is CCS? Now, CCS, in simply word put, it is just the old time step two CS, which we have patient encounters or practical cases. Or in your world of MBBS, I think you can call it the short case or the long case, right? Now, the CCS is something different because you're not going to be having a live interaction with the patient, but just imagine that you're giving or you, you're, you're doing a virtual test for the step to CS or you're virtually presenting a case to somebody else, right? So that's called the clinical case simulations. Whenever we talk about USMLE, whenever you think about USMLE, whenever you try to tackle questions on USMLE, this is exactly what you think. It's like, oh my God, kill me. Why is it so tough? Why is it so hard? Why is it this? <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> the reason is simple. There are multiple factors which makes the USMLE exams the toughest exam in the world. Now, the factors that reminds of why we feel that is mainly because of year of graduation. Because we know that most of the international doctors like yourself, they start preparation of the USMLE after they finish the internship or while they are doing the internships. So if you are preparing for your USMLE step one and you feel fresh by saying that you graduated yesterday, but still, you have to go back at least about four to five years when you were first year medical school to review the content. So that is why. Because here in the United States, the step one is being taken by students who finished their basic sciences yesterday. They don't have to wait till their clinical years are over. So that is why wherever I go, for some of you guys who are in your first year or second year, if you can, I would rather want to study for USMLE Step 1 Basic Sciences by supplementing the studies so that you don't have to waste a lot of time later on like your seniors did, and some of you guys are already doing it, so that you don't have to add another layer of one or two years in terms of your years of graduation. English language proficiency, I really don't worry much about that in this particular audience. Format of questions and MCQs, this becomes a little bit challenging for some of the students internationally because where we come from, normally we are not invested fully on testing our questions in the main exams on MCQ format. So USMLE is 100% MCQs. So adaptation takes a little bit longer. Next is academic strength in medical school. So obviously, if you are not a bright student or you are below average student, so you will need to revise and review all the contents all over again. It's going to take a little bit longer time. Misguidance and lack of structure and support. This is one of the main factors that also kind of throws you off the gear when you are preparing for USMLE. 
because you can have a lot of advices from a lot of people, but not all the advices are justified. They're not verified. They're not true. Or maybe it was true at one point of time, but it no longer holds truth right now in the current context. So be really careful whenever you seek advices. Try to get the advices from the right person who is up to date and who does this each and every day rather than your uncle or aunt who has done that at one point of time in their life. Because it may have worked and that information is true at their time, but it no longer bears any kind of truth right now. All right, let's move forward. I know that this is a very interactive session. I know that you guys are very bright candidates from your part of the university and also your country. So let us try to dig deep into why USMLE steps are difficult. Now let's try to play around with the first step. <clears throat> this is a clinical case scenario, question one for step one exam. I'll give you some moment to read through this, and this is the case. I know that there's some lag between the time that I speak versus the screen change. So in the meantime, let me read it out to you as well. A 22-year-old male comes to the outpatient clinic with fever for past two weeks. Fever associated with nighttime awakenings and shortness of breath. No changes in diet, but reports a weight loss of approximately 10 pounds. He has a past history of epilepsy. He volunteers at a homeless shelter where he often helps serve food to the patrons. <clears throat> All right. Now, the reason why I'm not showing you the questions, I mean, choices right now is for a reason, right? Because whenever you are tackling USMLE questions, read the clinical vignette and the question, but cover the choices with a small sheet of paper or a postcard. Because generally speaking, you have the tendency of looking back at the choices and then going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. But in USMLE, you don't have the luxury of time, primarily because each and every question approximately has around a valid timeline of one minute, 17 seconds. Okay. <clears throat> what is the diagnosis in this case? Very easy. I know most of you guys are typing, it's like TB, 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 that is correct but that is not a USMLE step one question. How about this? What causes TB? Since I said it's TB, it's very easy that now more students are typing in micro TB, micro TB. That is correct, but that is too easy an exam question for USMLE. This is the real cap, uh, sorry, the, the USMLE exam for step one. Which of the following is a characteristic of the causative organism? That is the real question. These are the choices now. A, B, C, and D. Okay. The answer is D it produces a heat sensitive catalase, okay? Now you know that this particular exam, I mean, example of the question for step one is not so easy because what's the diagnosis, what's, what causes TB is what your MBBS exam question is, right? But here, this is a typical example of triple jump question, which means, first of all, to answer this question, you need to know the diagnosis of the disease. 
Secondly, you need to know the causative organism. And then third only, then you will know the characteristic of the causative organism. So this is called a triple jump question. The second thing that I wanted to add is why is your assembly step so confusing, so complex, so tough, and so rigid? Uh, for step one, you should understand, most probably you might not know, but the step one questions are being set not by the MDs or doctors. Not, I wouldn't say doctors because, but they are mainly formulated by the PhDs. They are also doctors of some kind, right? <clears throat> Excuse me. So the step one exam mainstay formulation of the exam questions are being made by the PhDs. So that's why they go a little bit more into evidence based and research based questions. OK, good job. Now let's move on to the step two CK exam question. I will keep the case same so that we don't have to waste time. But the question changes over to what is the most sensitive test for the patient's condition? Okay, these are the choices. Chest x-ray, PPD, serum interferon gamma release assay, sputum culture, sputum AFB. The answer is sputum culture. Again, if you look at the question, you will realize that I have highlighted the word most sensitive, but this is not going to be the same in the exams. Okay, in the exam, they're not going to be highlighting it or making it bold or italized or something like that. So the reason the key word here is the most sensitive. If the question, the word changes to what is the first test, then the answer changes, right? If I say what is the most accurate, that is, again, another choice. And now the serum interferon gamma release assay is utilized in TB. Yes, that is true. But which kind of TB? Is it active TB or latent TB? Now, in this particular case scenario, the patient is having an active or a latent TB. Definitely, it is an active case of TB, and serum interferon gamma release assay is normally used during the latent TB. So, now we know how each and every word in the question kind of changes the answers from A to B to C to D to E. And this is one of the major mistakes that international doctors like us make, primarily because we run through the question and we presume that the question they are asking is this. But in reality, you really have to double check and double confirm whether they are asking the thing, and then you are not presumption. Uh, you are not being presumptuous. <laughs> so next one is the OET. Obviously, just like I said, it's very similar to the structure of TOEFL and IELTS test. They have listening, reading, writing, and speaking. And then the total score that you need to have is going to be 350 in each section, right? Three, four, uh, 350, that's 350 in listening, 350 in reading, writing, and speaking separately, okay? And then for more information, you can just go on to occupationalenglishtest.org. The last one is the step three exam. Now let's look at the question here. The same case scenario, the question changes again. The patient has started on four drug anti-TB regimen in addition to the phenytoin. What would you tell the patient, literally speaking? Now you see the transition from step one question to the step two CK question to the step three, right? The step one is asking you, who did it? How did they do it? Why did they do it? It means the diseases, right? And the organisms who cause that. Once you reach the step to CK, they're asking you, you told me it was Tom, not Jerry. But how do you confirm it was Tom and not Jerry and not anybody else? So these are the structures that changes in step to CK, right? And then now they also ask you for management. When you move over from step two to step three, 
they already presume that you already know who did it and you confirmed who did it and you managed it. But let us say after you manage the patient, he comes back after a few days or weeks by saying, Doc, Doc, you told me to take this medication. I took it. Now this is happening to me. How do you manage the post-management care? All right. What is the answer now? The answer is increased seizures. That's common knowledge, right? Common sense. Because now the person is taking anti-TB drugs, that is rifampicin, isinazid, pyrazinamide, and ethambutol. In addition to that anti-TB drugs that he's taking, he's also taking phenytoin for his seizure case. So obviously there's a drug interaction case this time in this question. So phenytoin is being fought by anti-TB drug, right? Which one? Isinazid. Now, isinazid is fighting with phenytoin. So you just imagine, sometimes when you're learning things, instead of just rote memorization, you just try to fancy yourself and animate yourself. Just imagine that there are four guys, strong guys. Out of the, the four guys, they are the anti-TB drugs. And isinazid is the strongest and the biggest and the most muscular and, the, you know, the most ferocious guy. Phenytoin is a thin guy, right? And now they're fighting. Who's fighting? Of all the four people, the strongest of the four, Iosin is it, the big muscular guy, the, the, the wrestler or UFC fighter, the boxer, jiu-jitsu fighter, whatever it's called. Now, when they're fighting, obviously you cannot expect Phenytoin to win. Phenytoin is being beaten up to the ground. It's like boom, boom, boom. And it falls flat. So, which literally means the potency of phenytoin is being diminished by the fight or the drug reaction. So, obviously, because of that reason, the potency reduces increased chances of more seizures happening in this case. Okay? All right. Next, jumping on to the next favorite question that most of people ask is, Dr. Stenson, how long will I need to prepare for step one or CK or step three? The truthful answer is, I don't know. And it's truthful because I don't know you. And it's truthful because not everybody is the same. But just to calm down the curiosity, the average timeline taken by any international medical doctors is anywhere from 9 to 12 months for step 1, 6 to 9 months for step 2 CK, OAT maybe 2 to 3 months max. And especially this particular audience, I would say even one to two months. And step three, depending upon how strong your content knowledge for step two CK is, I would say give or take three to four months. Now, when I'm talking about these average time, I'm not trying to talk about I'm doing a part-time job, I'm doing a part-time study. I'm talking about full investment of time, number one. And number two, when I'm talking about this average time, I'm not talking about you just passing the exam, but acing the exam, or in Indian lingo, they call it cracking the boards, right? Cracking the, cracking the neat PG, cracking the US simile with high scores. So that is what I'm talking about in terms of the time durations, right? The more time that you are being distracted with extracurricular activities and works and life and all those things, which is kind of sometimes uncontrollable, but you have to sacrifice sometimes, right? that you have to focus on only one thing at a time. Now let's talk about residency pathway. Now before we move on, let us try to understand and know these three people. The first one is the ECFMG, the second is ERAS, and the third one is NRMP. Now let's understand, because it's good to understand them, because you'll have to face them and say hello to them at one point of your journey. ECFMG is Educational Commission for Foreign Medical Graduates, which simply put, I would rather want to animate it just for your sake of understanding and, you know, kind of long-term memorization, so to say. You can consider ECFMG something like CBI, CIA, FBI, KGB, MI6, Mossad, etc. The reason why I'm saying it jokingly is you are telling 
the United States American Medical Association, that you're a doctor from India, Nepal, you know, China, Thailand, wherever. But the American Medical Association doesn't believe you. It's like, yeah, whatever, right? So what they did was they contracted the deal to ECFMG, which is a third party, and told them, listen, these foreigners are telling me that they are doctors from, from XYZ universities in this country. Can you verify them, please? So in ECFMG, when you first register yourself, you have to write a lot of forms. I mean, fill up a lot of forms and details. And then when the ECFMG receives that form, they will forward it to your medical school that you had said that you graduated from. And your medical university will verify that information back to ECFMG. Once the ECFMG receives the green signal from the med school, then they will send an email to you by saying, all right, Dr. Patel, you're all set to go and take the exam. You can choose the dates. That is exactly what the ECFMG's job is, the primary job. And then the second and the final primary job, I mean, second job of the ECFMG is after you finish the step one, step to CK and OET for now, they will certify you with an ECFMG certification. All right, let's move on to ERAS, Electronic Residency Application Services. Now, ERAS, for the sake of understanding, something like virtual post office. So just imagine that you're walking in a post office, a virtual post office. Just close your eyes and feel yourself going into a virtual post office. And at the counter, there's a postmaster. Then you say, knock, knock, I need to get a post box or a locker box. So obviously, nothing comes free, so you have to pay a token fees, right? And then you pay the token, you get the key to your locker box. And in the locker box, which is also virtual, you just imagine yourself putting in envelopes after envelopes. In that envelope, you're going to put in your USMLE scores, personal statement, CV, experiences, certifications, letter of recommendations, everything. And then you seal the envelope. And on the front of the envelope, you're going to designate who you want to send that to, right? So you're going to say University of Chicago and then NYU Hospital or Cornell and Harvard or this community programs. So whatever programs and medical specialties you want to send to, you designate that and then wait. Okay. And then on September 15th, you're going to press the enter button and all your digital envelopes that you've sealed and designated flies off your Erox locker box and then reaches to the programs. And then the program is going to send back a reply by saying, welcome to the interview. And then these are the dates options. So please choose one and let us know, let us know ASAP. So that is the ERAS application services. Third, not the last, <laughs> is going to be NRMP, which is National Resident Algorithm, uh, sorry, Matching Program. So NRMP is nothing but a computer program. So let us say that you filed for the application, you got some interviews, and then you come back. Let us say you got five interviews. And out of five interviews, in the month of February, you have to sit down and rank your programs. Which do you love the most and which do you love the least? So you're going to rank number one, number two, number three, number four. And on the same time, in the month of February, the programs are also kind of matching the candidates that they interviewed, right? So when we call match, it's just about they have to match you number one and you have to match them number one, so it becomes a match. So the tricky part where we don't have any control of all these processes is going to be your NRMP, okay? But again, at the same time, it's important to know, but it's not really important for you to have any control over it because you don't have any control over it, all right? <clears throat> now let's talk about the application process and the match timeline quickly. Follow up, step one, step to CK, OET. After you finish these three exams with high scores, you will be certified by the ECFMG. After the ECFMG certification is done, what does it mean? It means two things. Number one, you are now eligible to partake in the application process. And number two, you are now eligible to take the step three exam. Because step three, unlike the step one and two and OET, you cannot take in any order. You have to be ECFMG certified to be eligible to take the step three exam. 
All right, let us say, number one, you got ESAFMG certified. This is an important timeline. You can take a screenshot in the month of June. That is the time that you walked out to your post office and said like, hey, please give me a token, right? For the virtual locker box. And then after you got the token all the way from July to mid-September, you're going to be sealing up each and every envelope, so to say, like we discussed. In the month of September, the 15th, then you will send the applications to program because before September 15th, they will not allow or they will not activate that enter button. After you send the applications, your interview starts typically from January, I mean, October till January. And then by mid-March, you should be getting a great news in your email by saying, congratulations, you matched into this program. And then finally, in the month of June or some programs, they even go up to July, your residency begins. Now, step three, like I said earlier, it is an important aspect, especially being an IMG who is on a visa status. I would normally recommend any of the international medical graduates to do and finish the step three when they apply. Number one, you will look more attractive than the other candidates. Number two, nowadays, since two or three years, I've seen a lot of programs that change their stance. Meaning, in the past, step three exam is not necessary or required for you to do residency training. Step three, by itself, is meant for your license to practice medicine. So generally speaking, the American students, they will take the step three exams about the final year of their residency, so one year prior to their residency end so that when they finish the residency, they can start working and making money. But these days, like I said, a lot of failures are happening in step three. So the program directors, they changed. They're requiring the students to take the step three after they finish their first year of their medical residency, right? So the failure chances are gonna be much more minimal because especially in the surgical fields, which is about four years or five years of residency, let us say you're a general surgeon or OBGYN or psychiatrist, then you'll become the rocket scientist of your specialty, but you may have forgotten the rest of the four other subjects that is gonna be tested in step three, right? So that is why in order to minimize that, so they are now formulating a rule or requirement that if you don't pass your step three after first year, you will not be promoted to the second year of your PG, all right? So all these things are good. And last, not the least, as a visa holder, if you do have a set three, then I would have more chance of giving you the good visa, which is the H-1B visa rather than the J-1. The J-1 visa is not a good visa, personally speaking, because after you finish your residency training, you have to return back to your country for two years. And obviously, when you have invested a lot of time, money, sweat, and tears, to get all the way through here, you would rather want to get the step three and get your H-1B instead of finishing a residency training and going back to country. All right, now next moving on, let us talk about how do you get residency interviews? Now let's look at that. This is the application season, right? Like I said, in September, the application you will send from 15th on a typical month or a typical year. Um, September 15th to September 30th, there are about two weeks. It's very less likely chances. I, I would say like, you know, 20% chances that you would receive an email for your interviews. But here on the other side, bulk of your interviews are being held in the month of October, almost about 50%. Then as and when you move from November, December, January, automatically you see the chances of you getting interview calls would be slimmer and slimmer and slimmer. So what does it indicate? It indicates that everyone should have all their required scores prior to September so that they shoot the application right on the 15th so that they don't miss any chances of interviews. <coughs> Okay, I'm not saying that if you miss the train by October, then you will not get into the interviews. But again, when, do you, when you look at this data, 
you will see it. It's self-realized. The chances are getting slimmer and slimmer. Okay? Now let's talk about when you apply to programs, what are the chances that your application gets rejected or accepted? Now when you look at this, it all depends upon how and which side of the coin you're looking at. It's 50-50 chances, right? Now, you can be so decimated right now by thinking, as that, oh my God, it's only 50% chances that I'll get an interview. Or you can be one of those by saying that I want to be in that 50% who gets the interview call. All right. But again, let me pause here. And then it was during my last visit to India before the pandemic. Yeah, before the pandemic, it's just about a month before. <clears throat> that I was having discussions with students in, I think, Hyderabad or somewhere else. So I was kind of uh, amazed at the logistics numbers, right, at the data. Your chances in India to get residency or post-graduation is almost about one is to nine, right? One chance out of nine people. Versus your chance of getting residency in the United States is one is to two. Which means if two of you apply for USMLE exams and apply for residency here, one of you will get it. Whereas if nine of you guys take the NEAT PG or whatever exams now, then you have a chance on one out of nine. So that's, that's kind of really kind of threw me off guard. And I was like, wow, okay, that's, that's so tough. Where did I get those numbers from? It's kind of simple. Numbers may change every year, but more or less remains the same throughout decades I've seen. What is the total number of positions available versus how many participants or candidates are there vying and fighting for that? So that is how you kind of read the structures and get the sense of how easy, uh, not, not easy, but how easier or how much likelier chances you have getting into residency in the United States. Okay, coming back to the same topic, uh, main topic, rejection and acceptance rate. All right. Now, why do people get rejected? I said 50% of them get rejected, right? Now, for that reason, you need to understand what the program director's office is looking for in a candidate. That's important, right? The first filtration, we call that, some programs call it filters, some call it screening processes, but you get the idea, right? Obviously, each and every program on an average, gets anywhere from 1,000 to 500, uh, 1,500 applicants for about approximately 10 seats. So they're not going to waste their time calling each and everybody for the interviews and wasting the faculty's time. So they have to eliminate those. So the first filter that they're going to use unanimously all across the board is going to be based upon the scores, scores, and scores. How does that happen? Now, let's say I'm the program director for this year, and then I'll call my program coordinator, Jennifer, and ask her how many positions do we have? She will say 10 or 20 or 25, whatever. How many applicants? She'd say 1,500. And it's like, okay, let's put the filters. Uh, let us put the first filter as whoever scored less than 250 or 240 in step one, fire them out. And then she will do that. And then it's like, okay, still too much. Let's repeat the same filter for the step to CK. And let's kick somebody out who has failed more than one time. So you get the idea, right? The second cut is going to be based upon application package. Now, what includes in the application package is strong letter of recommendations, United States clinical experiences. Now, USCE becomes a more important thing right now than ever. Because many years ago, they just wrote clinical experience. But recently, they started writing United States clinical experience is preferred. And now that most of you guys are already aware that ECFMG just kind of broadcasted yesterday, USMLE, step one is now going to be done on January 26th. That's your Republic Day, right? So it starts while India is celebrating its Republic Day. USMLE step one goes from, you know, digits to pass and fail. And then second, uh, the third one is going to be your personal statements, research and publications, or any achievements, awards that you won in your medical career. 
So that is exactly what the application, strong application should look like. Then the third cut is going to be the interviews. Let's say that you're a really great looking person or a candidate on paper, but you are not a people skills. You don't have that social skills. You are not that communicative. You're a nerd, simply put. So obviously, during the interviews, you know also your friends who are the toppers. Some of them, not all, they're, they're very antisocial or they're very introvert. But here in America, when you go for interviews, they don't normally prefer those because they have to spend about three to five years, depending upon the specialties, doing the rotations. So you would rather want to have somebody much more sociable and amicable personality rather than just bookworms and nerds and rocket scientists. Okay. And the last fourth cut is going to be the rank order listing. All right. Now that we understood the selection process, the first one, like I said, always remains to be the score, score, scores. So as you see, if you have scored just about 200, 20% chances of getting matched, and then 250, 260 plus, then are almost about 90 whopping percent chances of getting into residency. Now here it says step one, but it is unanimously the same for step two CK as well as step three. Okay. Now the question is, all right, Dr. Tenzin, I got it. But how do I score high? You would score high by doing the correct way of studies. Let us say this is the X and Y graph, right? The content and the questions. Now, as and when you move from left to right in terms of time, getting prepared for your exam, you would invest more time of the day building up content by reading the materials by watching the videos by doing chapter quizzes right and reviewing 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 but as and when you move from the left to right somewhere around 50 percent of the time then you see that you are doing less and less content review why because you are now finishing the content reviews right but at the same time the orange or the purple what whatever color you can see is the questions the number of questions that you're doing is also slowly but surely increasing every day. I am not saying do not do questions. The biggest problem and the mistake that IMGs make, especially from your region, is they learn from the questions. They look at the question and then they learn the content. But in USMLE, this thing is not never going to work. And I'll tell you the why, uh, the reason why. Back in your country, you study throughout the year, and about a month before the exam, you will buy the most frequently asked questions for the last five to 10 years. And you memorize the heck out of it, right? And out of 50 questions, it is guaranteed that at least about 70 to 80% of the questions are going to be magically reappearing in your exams, including the punctuation marks. Somehow, I don't know, I don't know. I don't know how it works, but it works. And it goes for many, you know, many years. You may ask your seniors five years or four years before, and they have been passing these kind of exams, I mean, passing these kind of booklets over to, your, your, to you and your generations also, right? <clears throat> but the USMD exam is totally a different animal. And the reason why your philosophy of learning the content from the question because no questions are going to be ever repeated. All right. The reason being, let us say question number 25 is a question that almost about 80% of the students were able to get it right. Then that question number 25 is going to be trashed out of the main pool of questions. They're going to be removed. And at the same time, if 80% or more of the students were not able to answer question number 50 or 40, then they are also going to remove that. So now you see, depending upon the two extremes of the question levels, if it is too hard, that question is removed. If it is too easy, it is removed. Now, obviously, two extremes are removed. It has to be replaced by new questions. So those are called the experimental questions. But the funny part is that even though that's called experimental questions, which is not going to be marked and scored, you will not know which questions they are. So therefore, you have to treat as if each and every question is going to be scored. So now you know the reason why the question 
and learning the contents from the question will never work. So you have to build your content strong and then slowly but surely start doing the questions later on. That becomes the right, method, uh, right methodology for becoming a successful student in scoring high. Now, I know that there's a mixed pool of students and audience in here. So for those, like I always, whenever I travel to schools, I always urge the deans and the directors and the stakeholders to kind of advise the students to start studying basic sciences in the basic sciences years. And one of the most common questions that I faced from your region is, Dr. Tenzin, but how can I study for USMLE if I'm studying for MBBS because our curriculum is so, you know, so full. I am not asking you to study philosophy or Sanskrit in addition to your MBBS. I'm simply saying you are studying anatomy in the morning, let us say brachial plexus, all right, or solar plexus, or neuroanatomy. That's what you do during the morning sessions in school. Now in the evening after you come back, take a little bit of a nap, freshen yourself, and then open up that particular section in the Kaplan notebooks, lecture notes. Open up the brachial plexus part and then read through it. And then after you finish that, open up and log into your Kaplan on-demand videos on brachial plexus and read that. And at the end, practice some questions on brachial plexus, right? So now let's go back and rewind. In the morning, Professor Reddy taught you brachial plexus in class. That's number one. Number two, you went back and opened up the lecture notes from Kaplan Books and read brachial plexus. That's number two. You also opened and watched the videos on brachial plexus from on-demand videos. Number four, while you are watching the videos, there are chapter quizzes on brachial plexus. That's four. And number five, you picked up some questions, not have to be humongous and many, but like four or five questions on brachial plexus. So you have studied brachial plexus once, twice, thrice, four, five times. So next morning, you'll not only become a stronger and a smarter person in the class to excel the knowledge in whatever you studied yesterday, but without you even knowing it, by the time you finish your basic science years, you have already finished one full round of review for step one exams. So you are just now getting ready to take the step one exam while you are in your basic science, I mean, while you finished your basic science years. So you are exactly following the same track as the US medical students. So obviously that is the big difference that it makes. So now I think that I was able to debunk the myth that I cannot do study for USMLE because that's not two different animals. That is the same subject. But again, the title, the nomenclature is different. Okay. While you are doing the study, <clears throat> we break it down into three aspects of the study or three phases. Review phase, remediation phase, and practice phase. Obviously, when you look at this percentage of time, not you know money or anything else, 60% of your preparation should be embedded and invested in your review, the contents. And then move on to the remediation part. When we are talking about remediation, we are talking about you being revising the contents by somebody else. For example, attending the live online lectures. Or if you want to come here in the United States, you can attend the live in person with the faculties. Right? So that is the revision being done by our faculties for you, just for the last minute revision. And then at the end, the phase is called the practice phase because now you're going to spend almost about 100% of your time doing questions after questions after questions after questions. So obviously, what right now I see in India and Asia happening is that they put the practice phase first and then they review last. So now you see that this is not going to work. I know it's going to be hard to break your habits, but always try because this is going to go a long, you know, long term in your life, at least for your USMLE journey. All right. Now let's look at some of the matched datas from the last years. 
this is the last year's match. And then when you look at this pie chart, you see almost about 50% of them are obviously the US medical students because they have the first preference. Just like in your country, you'll give your own domiciles the first preference and then foreigners the next. So same thing here. However, when you look at the other half, almost more than the one third of that area is being covered by the IMGs. That's international medical doctors like yourselves. So it's a good piece, right? And let's look at it from other perspective. In the 2020 match, non-US IMGs, their matching rate was 61%. That is a great number also at the same time. Now, when you look at it, over the past 10, 11 years, there has not been a single year where there was a drastic drop. It has gone up, 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 and up all the way to 61.1% in 2021, uh, 20. Now let's look at the latest match result, 2021. Now when you also look at this, non-US IMGs, the number of people getting matched went up by 134. So why am I telling you these things and why am I sharing you these information? Primarily to remove this myth or thought that, you know, Oh, I don't think that I'll be able to match in the United States. Now, all these numbers are nobody but international medical doctors like yourselves. So if they are having these, I mean, I may lie, people might lie, but numbers don't lie, right? So obviously, bear that in mind, your chances of getting into residency match in the United States is way higher than you ever thought. Now, that being said, it doesn't mean that just because you wish to get residency match, you will match, but you have to work hard for it as well. All right. And then last not the least, on that particular context, there's another one good news that recently the United States passed a legislation. They have been talking about this for the longest time that I heard. But thankfully for Corona, you know, I can look at, I mean, you can look at from the brighter perspective or negative perspective. But because of Corona, I think they speeded up or hastened the process of passing this legislation. That being said, they have now decided to increase 1,000 residency positions in the years to come. So these are all great news, advantage IMGs. Now let's talk about the top specialties for you, non-IMGs, non-US IMGs. So these are the specialties. I know that some of the specialties that you might be looking might be missing here, but this is just to get an idea. Especially look at this middle section, non-US IMG, number of people. <coughs> Okay, now this ties up to a favorite question from you. Is it true that surgical specialties, they don't like IMGs? Uh, or is it true that internal medicine people likes IMGs? Now, you have to look at it from the perspective of not like and love and hate, because that's not just, <laughs> there's no discrimination here. But when you look at the statistics of number of positions available, versus number of applicants. So the surgical programs, they're a little bit tougher. I'm not saying impossible. I'm saying a little bit tougher than many other specialties, primarily because the number of positions available is also drastically lower. Whereas when you look at internal medicine, family, pediatrics, so, uh, psychiatry, etc., then the number of IMGs getting into those residency specialties are much more higher not because they love or like you, but simply because their supply is much more available, even after filling in their local domestic students. So this is how you have to think about it. That being said, if somebody is interested to become a dermatologist or radiologist, or orthopedic surgeon or plastic surgeon, get on with that dream and then you will start studying harder. But I know most of the IMGs, when I talk to them, what specialty are you applying for? Then normally they say, uh, sir, I want to do this, but I know that I don't have a chance, so I'll settle down for something else. Please don't do that, because if you do that, then mentally you are stopping yourself from excelling and performing the best, because you know that it's tough. But you're not going to give up. You're going to give a fight. And then even if you miss that by a few points, then you will still get the higher scores, right? So bear that in mind always. Okay, 
Why Kaplan? I know there are a lot of resources available under the sky right now these days, especially with the internet boom. You know, but I would advise you not simply because I work for Kaplan, but I most importantly, whenever I travel and meet with you in person or online these days, I do remember myself being you at one point of time, right? And it gives me much more pleasure to talk to medical students because, well, personally speaking, it makes me feel younger by looking at you and talking to you because it just takes me back into the memory lanes when I was in medical schools, right? So whatever I'm saying here does not necessarily mean that I'm working for Kaplan and speaking the language. I'm talking my language as a doctor, as your friend, as your colleague, as your senior, as a mentor, as whatever you call it. Kaplan has been there. There are a lot of other resources. Don't get me wrong. The other resources, some of them are okay. Some of them are really good, right? But a successful student who scores high is not necessarily the guy or the girl who has the maximum number of resources. In fact, I have noticed some of the cases, the more resources that you have able to capitalize on your table and desk or in your thumb drive, it confuses you more. The ultimate sauce, to seek, uh, secret sauce, is knowing how to utilize the resources in which priority, right? This is what I always say. I would recommend normally to build the foundational structure of study with the Kaplan materials because it's much more expansive, not expensive, expansive. It's much more detailed, right? Build your foundation with one layer of review with the Kaplan review uh, materials, be it from the books, videos, live lectures, or in person coming to New York, etc. And then after that, you evaluate yourself by doing the QBAX and then move on to the next level by doing first aid. I know the most common advice, which is very, very wrong, that people tell you, and you must have already seen it, or maybe some of you guys are already doing it right now is unanimously like, oh, read the first aid, do the your world, and then you'll take the exam and you'll pass. Well, I wish that was the case, but not people. People are not going to tell you. It's like, oh, shoot, you know, I did that and I failed. Oh, I did not score high. I would rather want you to do the ground structure layout or foundational study with the Kaplan materials, build it up later on with reviewing it with first aid, which is also an excellent resource, and then move on to the U world not the other way around. Because Kaplan QBank is so complicated, but it's a very good source for you to learn the content and understand the content, to grab the content. And the first aid is gonna be just one book, but it's a good systemic review book, right? It goes through system through system. And last not the least, UWorld is relatively also a very good source for you to practice, you know, for the exam. So, Kaplan has been in the business for almost about 80 years in terms of test prep admissions for SATs, ACTs, MCAT, LSAT, GMAT, what you have under the sky. Literally, you name any test, Kaplan has the test prep, you know, kind of um, courses. But Kaplan Medical has been there as a pioneering company for USMLE. So all our faculties, they're currently active and teaching in the hospitals, and they're very handsomely paid. I'm not going to tell you how much they're getting paid per hour, but they're very handsomely paid because they're very close in connection with what is the new trends in the exams, right? So obviously, we have up-to-date syllabus and curriculum depending upon the national exam trends, and then we keep all our online as well as offline resources fully up-to-date. Now, in terms of the course options, I'm not going to spend much time here because you can contact LogiQuest, which I'm going to show you at the end. But when it comes to choosing the course contents, it obviously depends upon who you are and where you are and what are you. Now, basically, you have to understand and ask this question first. Do you think you are that kind of a person who studies best alone at home? Or are you that person who studies better with the setting of other friends as a group discussions or interactions. So that being said, you can decide whether you want to take the live online classes. Live online classes are similar to watching NDTV or CNN or BBC or Z News, 
Star TV, right? The only difference between watching CNN live is that you cannot chat with the newscaster. But here in the live online, the faculty, you can interact directly with the chat room, right? You can just ask questions. That is that. On demand. On demand is simply put, it's just like your Netflix account or your Amazon Prime account, right? Where you can see all the videos anytime you want to at your own pace. Fast forward, rewind, pause, go back again, check. That is the on demand. Now, the in center with live lectures is means that you have to be physically present in New York because we have a six floor building which is only dedicated to only medical students who are vying. So when you come here, you have the building full of your colleagues from all the parts of the world who is coming here for only one mission. The mission is USMLE and getting interviews and getting matched. So obviously not only in terms of attending the live lectures with the faculty members, but you have a big opportunity of networking. And then obviously, like I mentioned earlier, in terms of the communication and social skills, I know that you guys may be sociable, but Indian sociable way is slightly different from the American way also. So when you come here, you don't become shocked. Let's say you scored really high and then you come to United States for your interviews, then you think that you're sociable in your part of the world. But over here, it come out, it may come out as an awkwardness. It's like, oops, okay, that's kind of weird. So you don't want to have that chance given to the program directors or the faculties down the lane. So when you come and settle down and study for USMLE in New York, you would be exposed to multicultural ethnicity background, everything. You would know how a black person talks and walks, Hispanic, right? Uh, European, Russian, Asian, Chinese, have you everything right so you become a much more knowledgeable person in terms of cultural uh, adaptation last not the least when you're coming here to the center you have some of your friends who have already taken the step one and two and now they're matched but by virtue of you being friends while you were studying in Kaplan he or she might become the chief resident at the second or third year during that time just because by virtue of your friendship, he or she might be able to help you get a residency interview, even if your scores are okay, right? So obviously these kind of networking opportunities are also huge, which is undervalued right now. People are just like, why am I supposed to go to New York? If I can study in my home, I'll save money, right? It's not just about the money part, but there are a lot of advantages that you come here. I'm not saying that you have to, right now because obviously situations in India are slightly different right now. In fact, or maybe looking at the other way, I always look at, look at the other way. Looking at the other way, you might want to escape India right now while the pandemic is really high, right? You might want to come into the United States to study. But again, I'll leave the decision to you. All right. Now, why study in New York? We already said that, right? Now, the top 12 IMG friendly states. Later on down the lane, when you finish with all the steps, when you have everything in your application package ready, there comes a time that you have to shoot for applications. Now, this is the US map, and then you see the red dots, which represents the IMGs doing the residencies or fellowships. Now you see, it's, it's self-explanatory that there is California, there's Florida, there is the northeastern part of US and then a little bit of that in Chicago and Wisconsin area. Now, if you are not a native Spanish speaker or you don't know how to speak Spanish, then your chances get a little bit diminished in Florida or California. Because, not because they don't love you, they love you, but the main patient population that they cater to speaks Spanish. So they would rather want to prefer somebody who speaks Spanish than not, right? But I'm not saying don't apply. It's like apply, there may be chances, but you have to be smart because when you send application, each and every application is gonna cost money. Now, when you look at the right boxes, the top IMG friendly states are given down <clears throat> and number of IMGs matched as well. Now, when you look at this triangle, New York, New Jersey, and Connecticut, when you combine these three states, they call it the tri-state. 
and tri-state over past 10 years, I've been looking at the data, they have been combined as top states over the past 10 years consistently. So obviously, these three areas have the highest density population of the IMGs that matched. And then obviously, since you're going to be staying and studying in New York, you have higher chances of getting matched because you'll look for some observerships, rotations, and clerkships, etc., etc. Now, where are we located? We are located just about three blocks away from Central Park. Then about four blocks down, after you've finished your study, you can take a stroll to the Times Square. And then a little bit downtown, then you'll be able to go and see Statue of Liberty with your friends and families. I know, I know. You guys must be thinking like, okay, am I going on a New York City tour? No, the reason is we are centrally located around the IMG-friendly hospitals like Albert Einstein, Bronx, Lebanon, Mount Sinai, Jamaica, SUNY Downstate, St. Barnabas, Brookdale, Lutheran, North Shore, Wyckoff, Interfaith, Kingsbrook. And these are the highest population of IMG absorption for the residency programs. So while you are studying with Kaplan, these hospitals are the ones that you can look for volunteer work, research, etc., etc. So that you're already showing a face in front of the program by saying like, hey, I'm not going to come at the last minute by saying I want to be a resident here, but I'm just looking for opportunities. Like, you know, while I'm studying here, can I do a part-time? Um, but again, don't do this early on without finishing a step one and at least step two CK. All right. So your opportunities are much more higher in that vicinity. And obviously, we have the Kaplan Medical Advising Team, which is going to walk with you from the get-go. They make you a study plan that you can stick and then meet regularly with them to update and see and focus that you are right on the track. And obviously, when it comes to ECFMG certification or registration, they'll be able to help you with that. And not only that, after you finish your steps, when it comes to application season, you can help them, you can ask them for help for resume, CV, personal statements, whatever have you. So it's, uh, you know, Kaplan Center or Kaplan Online Courses. They have a one-stop shop that not only you will learn step one, but you will learn step two CK, OET, step three, and then later on even more, uh, building a camaraderie. Okay, let's move on to changes from USML and ECFMG. Now, obviously, step one, moving to pass and fail. We'll talk about that in the next slide. Exam failure attempts reducing from six times to four times. I'm not worried about that because I don't even care. Why? Because I don't want any one of you or any one of my students to fail even once. Forget about four times. Step two CS is discontinued and canceled and replaced currently with OET, but may most probably be also replaced by something else. Now, what something else? Nobody knows, including me, but there's a discussion going on that they could be replaced by something like Minisex. Now, Minisex is mini clinical examination, so which is very similar to, like I said earlier, when I, when I was talking about the CCS cases. In your final years and interns or even during your PGs, you, you watch your PGs, right? They have the rounds. So presentation of rounds, case presentation. So that's something like mini-sex, right? Okay, so most probably that could happen. But will it happen or not? Only time will tell and they will, I mean, they're the deciding body. So they have to kind of let us know what they're moving on to. Now, how will this affect IMGs? So like I said, after 26th of January 2022, they said that they'll move forward with pass and fail. That being said, before we go up on this slide, now the favorite question is, Dr. Stenson, should I take the exam now or should I wait for the pass and fail? Honestly speaking, depending upon your strengths and weaknesses and readiness for the exam, I would rather recommend you to be in that pool of people who took the exam and got scored digitally rather than pass and fail. And I'm not saying this. We're saying this primarily after discussing with a lot of programs and directors and chairmen. They said, well, we already rejected that, but it's up to them because ultimately we don't have the decision-making power. We can only discuss and we resented that 
this move is going to be bad for us because we would not know who who the candidate is in terms of the academics if we have only pass and fail. Now, if it's pass and fail, we're not going to be able to find out whether he passed just well or passed really well, you know, because it doesn't make sense. And then, ultimately, what they are saying is that if you have, even they started in 2022, for at least two to three years, there will be a mixed pool of people and candidates having the scores versus pass and fail. So they said we would rather give preference to the first person uh, for, the, for, the, for the candidates who have scored digitally and then give the second preference to that because ultimately whether the decision for or the, the step one to pass and fail is not in their hands but decision to choose the candidates is in their hands so it's like all right if they decide let them decide once they come to our table we'll decide whatever we want to decide so that's that so in short if you are strong and good and ready to go for taking the step one exam right now while before it's changed to pass and fail, I would recommend that because a score sounds and looks much more appealing and enticing and real than just pass and fail. Okay, for those of the students who are yet to start their studies, obviously they will be late because obviously we only have about what, like eight or nine months now before the change takes place. What does it matter? How does it affect me? Right Then obviously now that step one is going to be pass and fail, they will start laying more emphasis on the scores on CK and step three. They will look more focused on number of attempts or failed attempts. They may also look into your medical school performances. And then obviously letters of recommendations and US clinical experiences. And they may also give importance on year of medical school graduation as well. Now these are like may, 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 right? Because ultimately, it is up to the program's office to decide what factors they're going to look at. Okay, now all of you guys are like, okay, all clear. But, Dr. Tenzin, uh, okay, but, uh, I don't have the money, right? But I want to be in this person's place. I want to be this guy who is a happy doctor minting money, crazy that he's having fun. But in order to be here, you need to be investing, not spending. Spending is the wrong word. In order to be this guy in a happy, successful, professional career in medicine or surgery, then you have to be at least getting started with the investment of your time. Now, if you're telling me you don't have money, I will give you money. How about this? If you kind of prepared well, dedicated yourself, sacrificed a little bit here and there, then you got into residency. In India and Nepal, I think, and some parts of Asia also, and even in Latin America, for you to get into post-graduation or residency, you have to pay the hospital money. Right? And then they give you back a small token. It's like pocket money, a change, which is nothing as compared to what you give them. But be assured, one big thing that I want to clear out, at least for this audience, is in the United States, if you get into residency, you don't have to pay a single penny. Instead, you get paid a stipend. On an average, as of last year, the average payout for the stipend for residents all across the board is fifty-five to sixty thousand dollars a year for the first year PG. Second year, third year, fourth year, they would be increment above five to seven hundred dollars each. So this is not called salary because this is a medical training session, right? Residency training. So since you're a training, they call it stipend. But after you finish your residency training, then this is the amount that you're going to make. Now, see, I can watch all of you guys. Initially, you were far away from your phone or laptop, and all of a sudden, I'm showing you the money. Then you start getting closer and closer to the screen and taking screenshots of it left and right. <laughs> so let us say, as an internist, let us say today you graduated your residency training. Maybe you can take a rest for about a month or take off a week or something like that then you will have a contract signed for at least 
240 to 250 thousand dollars right there for the first year itself. And when I'm saying 240 to 250 thousand dollars as an internist who just finished three years of residency training, obviously this is just the beginning. Now obviously you can make more when you work more hours, right? You can become a hospitalist, you can do part-time job here and do that. But this is the minimum I'm talking about. And obviously the highest paid are going to be orthopedic surgeon, plastic surgeons, and you know, you see it. But again, boys and girls, it's good to talk about money because right now we don't have money. But in order to have this money, you need to ha do a hard work. You have to invest yourself. You have to sacrifice. Because without sacrifice and investing your time and money and blood and sweat, you'll never be reaching a happy part of your journey. That ties up to what the late president and founder of uh, founding fathers of this nation said, Thomas Jefferson. If you want something in your life you've never had, you'll have to do something you've never done. Very true. I repeat, if you want something in your life you never had, you have to do something you've never done. You can be like those fishes in the left bowl and complain and nag about your life, your, you know, your, your financial life, your sexual life, your political life, your religious life, your study life, your relationship life. You, you can just go on bickering and bitching about it the whole time. Or you can say, enough is enough. I need to move to a greener pasture. In order to do that, you have to take the first step. So you can be that fish who says, enough is enough. I'm sick and tired of being so miserable in life. So I want to just jump. So you have to do something that you have never done. Right? So bear that in mind. It's not always easy being a medical student, leading a medical student's life, being a doctor. Because like, it's not easy. But at the end of the day, Nobody will inspire you, but you yourself, right? Don't expect the teachers and faculties and friends. And they will come and say, like, hey, it's, it's going to be okay. But that stays for a few seconds and it'll go away. And then it'll come back again. So you have to ins you know, inspire yourself from deep within by thinking positive and doing the right thing. Not just thinking positive and leaving it that, but doing something. All right. That being said, if you want to do something that you have never done before, it sounds good. I know that most of us think like, yeah, okay, fine, I'm going to do this. And then think about it the next day. It's like, yeah, maybe I'll do it next day. Maybe I'll do it next month. You know, you just push. So every journey begins with a single step, right? But when we talk about, yeah, I know this, right? I know this. Every journey begins with a single step. Now, the question is, when do you want to take the first step? I'm not talking about the step one exam. I'm talking about the first move towards committing yourself to start investing your time and money on your assembly step one by preparations. All right. Uh, our marketing team asked me to share this, and obviously you guys must be aware of it. There's a special promotion which ends in about 10 days, I think, on April 30th. 40% off on the on-demand programs. So if you guys are thinking about joining the course, let's say some of the students ask me, it's like, Dr. Zin, if I, I'm not ready to start right now, I'm, I might be able to start somewhere after two or three months. It's like, fine, even if you want to start, you know, six, seven months also, you can just book the date right now and then avail the discount, lock the discount right now, and then put a start date in the future. That being said, if you have more information, more questions, sorry, more questions about packages and courses and discounts and programs, then you can communicate with Logiquist, who is our sole certified education provider. The numbers and contact information is there. And then Logiquist has been our traditional um, agent in your region. So feel free to reach out to them. They might be able to have all the answers that you might ask. And then they might have just 1% or maybe less than 1% of questions that they may need to include us. So we'll be more than happy to join in and then answer that questions to you guys as well. All right, take a screenshot of this. And last, not least, this is my email. 
So if you do have any questions about your personal lives, in terms of personal careers, etc., etc., then you are more than welcome to reach out to me if you're feeling shy to talk and chat in the main chat room. That being said, I would like to thank everybody who attended this seminar, and I hope that your time was worth of spending. If you do have any questions, you're more than welcome to put it in the chat. I do not know how I'm going to read the chat, but I think Abhishek is going to help me with that. Or maybe Abhishek, I, I'm in YouTube. I do not know how to go to the chat. It's kind of funny. Last time I was in India, people said, Dr. Townsend, do you have Insta? Do you have Insta? I was like, what the heck is Insta? It's like Instagram handle. It's like, okay. I heard a little bit about Instagram, but now what is the handle? You know, <laughs> it's like, I have Facebook. You can add me there. It's like, no, Dr. Townsend, Insta is the new thingy. So I came back and installed Instagram, but you know, we're not tech savvy. We're still in the Facebook world. Not like you guys. Okay, now I think I was able to see the questions here. I'll take some questions. Da -da 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 -da. Is there a chance for IMGs to get a residency in the neurosurgery program, Tejasvari Raj? Yes, definitely you have all the chances to get in neurosurgery program as well. Even if you may not, I mean, even though it's a tough program, very tough program, but it's not impossible. Generally speaking, what some people do in the IMG world, they do the general surgery first, and then they apply for neurosurgery. Neurosurgery program directly is kind of a little bit tough. What implication, where is that? What implications can the criteria pass fail be introduced in step one make? Will the personal credential CVs assume great importance if I want to six of match? Debunk would they? Yes, definitely. We covered that part as well. So obviously they will have more importance. They lay more importance on the step two CK scores and step three scores and CV LORs. It's to definitely they're going to take more weightage. Vishnu Prasad, what's the value of extracurricular activities on an application? <laughs> well, Vishnu, it depends. What did you do in extra? Right. If it's something like uh, medically related, then definitely it will definitely help boost up your CVs and uh, candidacy. Uh, is there a chance for MGs to mention Vasuda? How much chance is there medical school performance to be given more weightage? How much chance is there medical school performance? Like I said, Vasuda, it's not about, you know, not all the programs are same. So we are thinking like these could happen, but ultimately if Vasuda is the program director, she did not really care much about the residency schools, I mean, school, school medical performance. Because the toughest part, that's a good question that you raised though. The toughest difficult part for the program directors is that you could be from one of the worst, you know, baddest, uh, reputed medical school in the world, or at least in your part, of the, in your region. Or you could be one of the top Ivy League medical schools in your region. How am I supposed to know? I don't know. I, 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 I'm not going to waste my time trying to see the authenticity and then how reputed your institution is. So maybe from the ugliest, dirtiest, baddest medical school, their medical performance could be better than somebody who is in a reputed school whose performance was below average. So it does not necessarily make the mark. So that's that's why, you know, as conversations are happening, that's also going to be difficult. But one thing when you talk about medical performances, let's say I've started seeing, and some of the program directors even told me, not just because of the change, it's because like if you say that you want to become a surgeon or a pediatrician or an internist or ob or whatever have you, then generally some of the program director's office now are checking your final school year's result. Not about your performance all year round, but somebody, if we want to become a surgeon, your scores in surgery should be strong as well. You cannot be too weak in surgery and then you want to become a surgeon. So you get the point, right? Um, how difficult is it to get into surgical branch? 
Rajwal. That is a wrong question to ask, right? My question to you is, have you taken a step one first, right? Let me ask this. Because how difficult is it to get? The question itself is very negative and pessimistic. I would rather want to say, what are my positive chances of getting matched into, rather than what? how difficult is it? It's easy if you have beautiful scores, if you have everything under your belt in your credentials. Getting surgery is also doable. How updated is the pre-recorded lectures? Swaswata Biswas. How updated? They are constantly updated because it's an online uh, kind of a platform. So obviously, which if you, and this is exactly the MedFeed form back comes in, right? There's an email that you can send. If you feel that the answer is wrong or something needs to be updated, or something needs to be clarified, then you shoot an email to that particular platform and they will look into it and then they will get back to you. Maybe you were wrong. Maybe you read it wrong, right? Or maybe you were right that there needs to be an update in that. So it's a constantly updating process going on end to end. Pranav, what happens if you don't match? What happens if you die, right? I'm sorry. But that's, that's exactly what, what happens if you don't match. Well, you will not match if you believe that you're not going to match right now, right? You should be positive in terms of thinking like, what if I match, but not in neurosurgery, but in general surgery? That kind of a question should come. Can IMGs get into top IV colleges so you know any? Mani Teja, it's very, very possible that you will get into uh, top IV league colleges but at the same time don't be so fancied with the names because you can get and apply into Yale, Harvard, you know, all those Cornell, Stanford, all those places. Main thing that you need to understand is which program, let's say for example Maniteja is interested in, you know, let's say surgery. If you're interested in surgery, you have to find not the Ivy League hospitals, but you have to find which is the highly most reputed, renowned program for surgery. And you'd be surprised. Sometimes it could be housed in one of the community hospitals that has the strongest and badass kind of reputation for surgery being the top in the country. So just don't go by the title because you can be going into an Ivy League, but you could be coming out as a shitty resident because that program is not so strong. That specialty, I'm not talking about the name of the college. Is research mandatory to get matched? Surya is not mandatory, but it makes you more attractive if you have it. What will be the maximum expectancy for non-US engineers to get matched? Uh, what will be the maximum expectancy? Especially in research area, can you, know, can you quote something more on it, sir? Uh, sudden, sudden R. Most probably it must be red D. So, I do not know what you're saying. Can you quote something more on it? But what will be the maximum expectancy for non -US? And that, that question is kind of weird. I don't understand what you're talking about. But again, I think it ties up to earlier question of what are the chances? Well, obviously, if you try to get high scores, if you build up, especially for surgical fields, when somebody asks me about the research, do research, but make sure that you do research and comes up with the publication of your name. Because research without publication is just you lying to me. And especially for surgical uh, residencies, they normally prefer people with research published. I'm not saying that in uh, medicine, uh, medical uh, specialties don't need that, but they are better if you have it for both. What should be our course of action to prepare for step one if we are in our final year of MBBS? Namrata, I love this question, but you asked this question four or five years you know, later. So obviously right now you're fully, your hands are full in final year with a lot of exams and tests going on. So it's going to be much more difficult for you to go back and tie up. But again, something is better than nothing. So you can start just reading up one book at a time. And then whenever you have, you know, a little bit of ease of time in your family. Otherwise, it's going to be tough. How to manage time in third year to give step one in third year MBBS? Again, Swaswata Biswas, I think I'm going to tell you that you are three years late into this fray. But again, third year, I think, I don't remember which one, but like, you know, third year is the honeymoon year in India, I think.
somebody told me that if I don't remember whether it's the second or third year, but if that is so, then you can just put your you know put your brain and focus it on step one preparation. Then you have still time. Anxious eyelash. Whoa, that that's that's a beautiful name. Uh, electives are for undergraduates. Being part of the medical school that does not allow taking a break of internship, is it possible to get electives after internship? But before officially graduating, definitely. I mean, again, like I jokingly say, but in a right way. There are a lot of kind of ships, right? Uh, observer ships, extern ships, intern ships, uh, this ship, Titanic ships, elective ships. I don't care what kind of ships you're talking about. Ultimately, it's about medical, clinical experiences, right? So to your question, anxious eyelash, yes, you can definitely, but some of the universities, they allow you to take a break and a pause during your internship period. And I would highly recommend that during that time, you can take all the step exams and also do some electives, oh, I'm sorry, some, some uh, clinical experiences in the United States. And then go back and then finish whatever you were doing with, you know, one month internship left. So that'll give you two things. One, it will make your eyelash much more younger on page because you just graduated that time instead of, you know, a couple of months earlier. Right. And secondly, you were able to get things done while you were on that so-called, you know, break of Neil, is there any way we can apply to USC being a graduate and not having either steps? Well, Neil, a good question too. Do not try to jump in to get the USCE when you are young because your USC, you can get it. Nowadays, it's very easy. You can buy it. During our time, when you get a USCE opportunity, you literally earned it right? They will have rounds of interviews, you will be given a lot of assignments, and then they'll choose you. But right now, even Harvard and Yale and Stanford, you can literally buy it. So I'm not so fanciful about those kind of things. But the main thing is that I know do not make, I mean, I would, I would recommend you not to jump in too soon to do your USC. First, take your steps exams. Because you may get your residency, I mean, sorry, USC experiences while you're in third year, you can take a break and take about six weeks or seven weeks or whatever and do U.S. clinical experiences here. And then you will go back. Now, when I give you a letter of recommendation, it's going to be dated 2021. And then you'll go back to finish your third year, fourth year, fifth year internship. And then, then what? By the time it's already become four or five years old. So obviously, USC is important, but make it a fresh date, just like eyelash asked right just save it towards your internship period so that you can roll it out uh how do you get elective in the states and when do you think is the best time to do it nandita i think i just answered that should i focus on getting certificates or awards for cv in medical schools anything sparsh you can get your hands on but not fake ones okay getting certificates or awards anything which is related to your curriculum that is great all right, Shristi Higher Math. Is it possible in to take step one in October, November if they start the preparations now? Well, Shristi, I would love to say yes or no, but I don't know you, so I need to know more about it because I do not want to just blanket say like, oh yeah, maybe you should, you can. Right now is April, May, June, July, August, September, October, November. Most probably you will if you have got nothing better in life to do except to study for step one. But if you're a student and then you're busy with your own personal lives and work, then it's going to be a little bit tough. But again, even if you do take the exam, it's not about should I rush it. Uh, Saran, what will the maximum experience in non years in the maximum? That I think we have already said. How many months would you recommend to take preparation for step one? We already covered that, nine to 12 months. Uh, what is the best time to give step one exam during the med school? Well, after you finish the basic sciences. Um, master gadgets. Hey, I like that when the Indian students, they say like, hey, as if like we're buddies, right? So this is one of the biggest mistakes people make when I was talking about interviews, right? Social skills, people skills. You don't hate people that you don't know. 
Uh, what if I had failed my first year of medical school, but to be do well in the exam, would it affect me? Obviously, your failed attempts in your medical years is not as going to be affected as the other ones. So do not fail the step exams. That's more important than, you know, whatever is done in the past. What will the maximum is doing? Oh my God, this is again and again. Saran, leave me alone. You're going to write 186 times? <laughs> Someone from India got into Ivy League, and then she told me that chances are pretty slim. You need research papers, a lot of experiences, and most importantly, time. Saranya, yes. Obviously, these are not easy to get into Ivy Leagues. But again, like I said, why are you so fancied by the Ivy Leagues? Because at the end of the day, when you get out of your residency training, they care about whether you are coming out from the top-notch program rather than the university. Michelle, following 2022, the answer is yes, of course. They'll be more important now, after that. Uh, Raghav, is there a scholarship? A very typical regional question. Is there a scholarship? The answer is no. There is no scholarship. You need to pay. Nadita, how do you get elective in the States, and when do you think is the best time to do it? I think I covered that. The best time is to pause during your internship period and take all the exams and do rotations. Pranav, what happens if we don't match? How do we apply further? Well, we don't want to talk about negative things here, Pranav, so we should think about what if we match, uh, what if I match? Uh, but if you don't match, then you can reapply next year. All right, where am I now? How important is building your CV? Very important, Manvita. Uh, will there be a major? Will there be any effect if there is a year back in med school? Like I said earlier, it's not going to be that affected in comparison to your scores in the exam. I think there's just repetition, repetition, repetition. All right, then, I think we're going beyond the time. So I'd like to thank you all for attending this seminar. And like I said, if you have any questions, you're more than welcome to reach out to me anytime. And then I wish you the very best of luck. And hopefully when the pandemic situations die down, we will be able to meet in person when I'm visiting in your region as well. All right. That being said, thank you all. Have a very good evening and a very good night. And remember to stay safe because if you are not safe, then forget about matching. All right. Best of luck, guys. Take care.